Hello, and welcome to the Physical Therapy Owners Club podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Shields, and I've got Eric Miller, favorite financial planner on with us today with Econologics. Eric, hey, thanks for joining me again. My pleasure. My pleasure. Let's right. do it. Yeah. We've talked a, a, a number of times here over the past few months, and one of the topics that came up that I wanted to pick your brain on was that about partnerships. Um a lot of owners might go into ownership uh, independently, individually, right? Uh, and some of them might have a partner that they're considering opening up their first clinic with. Nonetheless, uh, I think it's an invaluable step to consider. Well, it's an invaluable thing to consider all the steps that make for a successful partnership. So for sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is a, this is a marriage and might be just as difficult as a marriage. <laughs> <laughs> it may be more. <laughs> it may be more difficult than a marriage and could cause just as much stress because you're spending as much time with this person as you do your spouse, right? Probably more. I mean, the work is seven tenths of your life when you right. think about it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you, when you have a, uh, when you have a partner in your, in your business, I mean, it, it's probably more so than your actual spouse because of the amount of time that you spend doing work. Yeah, you know, definitely. So you don't want to take it lightly. And there's a number of things to consider. And so I'm glad we're having this episode today, because we're going to break down a lot of the things, if not all the things that you not need to consider uh, about a partnership, right? How to formulate one, what it should look like and that kind of stuff. So uh, what should what, what should someone consider when they say, hey, I want to go, I want to partner with somebody, what do I do? Uh, yeah, how would you how, how would you first address that kind of question? Well, you know, they're, they're definitely, uh, I, I think it starts with, you know, there has to be alignment between you and this other person. And when I say alignment, uh, you know, they're it, just like a marriage, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't, it doesn't really work if it's built on the wrong reasons why you, you're getting married. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? If it's just for looks, that's not always going to be a good thing. So the same thing with a business partnership, you know, you really have to look at it from what do we have similar purposes, right? Do they have a purpose to whatever the purpose of the organization is, whatever the purpose that I have for the organization, do, are, we, do, are we on similar purpose lines here? Okay. Mm -hmm. Because you can imagine if one person's like, well, you know, I, I want to go this way and you want to go that way. It's, it's eventually not going to work. Mm -hmm. So I really think it, it needs to start with, hey, and, and what are the purposes? And then what are the goals of the organization? I think they have to be in alignment. Like, for example, you know, again, I, I can just tell you this from, from working with practice owners for 12 years. I, I have seen good partnerships, bad partnerships, and awful partnerships. Partnerships that blew up. Partnerships where it was just like, I mean, there, there's actually one where they, they were not talking to each other only through their attorneys. That oh, was wow. the only part. And I'm like, wow. oh, that's, that's bad. Okay. Yeah. Now, like anything else, like a marriage doesn't crumble overnight. Obviously, you know, a partnership has to be something that you're constantly creating. But I think to that degree, it, you need to have some fundamentals when you start off with it. And obviously the goals of the, of, of the, of the partners have to be very similar. Mm -hmm. Like we want to get to seven practices and we want to do 7 million in revenue a year. And we want mm -hmm. to eventually transition out and sell to, you know, uh, a corporate group, whatever it would be. It's, it's gotta be pretty similar. Cause you can imagine right. if one person's like, well, you know, I want to get to, to seven practices and $7 million. And the other person's like, you know, I'm good for like two and just mm -hmm. kind of coasting along, that's not going to work. Right. You know, so you really have to build that alignment in the front end. And then, you know, certainly there, there has to be some alignment on, uh, on finances too, mm -hmm. because money is, uh, is, a, is a big component part to partnerships. And, you know, there has to be some synergy there as far as, you know, uh, philosophically speaking, similar viewpoints on the subject of money. OK, because not one person's like, well, I need all this money right now. And the other person's like, well, we have we have set asides. We have to do this, this and this. And, you know, we, we can't just rip all this money out of the business. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah, so I can definitely see that. I, you know, just as you bring that up, I'm thinking just like a marriage, most marriages fall apart because of financial issues and financial strains. Wouldn't you say that could be the same issue with most most partnerships falling apart? How to appropriately uh, spend money? 
Yeah, it usually falls apart because one person thinks that the other person's not pulling their weight. Mm. So there's a there's a lack of exchange there. So mm. it has to be re- very much written out uh, as far as who's doing what in the organization. Mm-hmm. And and again, I think when you're looking at a partner, you want someone that can complement what your strengths are. Right. You know, and right. you know, let's say that you're a really good technician. Let's say that that you're very good at at practitioner work, but you're not a really good executive. Mm-hmm. So maybe you want to bring on a partner that, that can really, that can do those, that has those skills, right? you know? Right. And so it's just kind of building that, but there has to be that alignment to start with. Uh, of all the practice owners that you talk to that, to that are in partnerships, what would you say the percentage are of those that have been successful versus those who have not? I would think it'd be a large percentage that have not. That have not been successful? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. Uh, you know, it's, I, I will say this, it, it always starts off really good. Mm-hmm. They're really happy. Um, but like, like a marriage, one thing ends up happening is that you try to put the partnership on cruise control and you stop, you stop creating it. You stop, you stop communicating. like communicating, you stop spending time with each other. You stop doing all these things. And, and then all of a sudden it's like, Hey, you know what? Eh, eh, Maybe I don't like that person as much as I did. Yeah. Why do I need you? Yeah. Why do I need you? So it's like, it it, it is, you just have to make sure that you guys stay in communication. I mean, for, I have a partner and we talk, Mm -hmm. you know, we talk every day, but we, we have a dedicated hour every single week where we just go over basic, just to stay in communication of of what the direction of the organization is. What are our Mm -hmm. goals? What are the purposes? What are our targets? You know, because that way we're all kind of moving towards a a common, a common objective. Mm -hmm. And I think it doesn't mean that there isn't friction. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have upsets. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have any of these things, but you know, you have to have someone that has like an owner mentality, Right. You know, that that can take responsibility isn't just doing it for a paycheck. Right. Like I, I give you stories of that happening where you just have one owner that wants to expand. The other owner is like, you know what? I just want to come here nine to five when five o'clock I want to check out and that's it. And give me my percentage of the profits. That's mm-hmm. not going to work. Right. Yeah. I, I, I loved how you brought it back to a, a value alignment and goal alignment, because I think what worked out with Will and myself is is that not only did we have similar goals, we wanted to expand and uh, prudently expand and whatnot, but we also had shared very similar personal values. Like, I I think a lot of it ties back to we are like the same kid within our family. And our fathers were very much alike, we didn't learn this until later on. But and I don't necessarily think that partners have to go this far. But personally, we shared similar value sets. And, um, and it's because of that and the constant communication that we shared um, that we enjoyed being around each other. I mean, can you imagine being a partner with someone who you don't being, enjoy being around with? You know, that it, would probably be a recipe for failure. <laughs> it, it's going to fail at some point in time. It yeah. just, it, it, you don't, if you're enduring right now, if like you're, you know, you ever seen those relationships with people who just are, are together just because they can't imagine being apart from each other is too painful, right? <laughs> but they're yeah. just enduring. You don't, you don't want to do that. But I, I can tell you, any any relationship can be fixed. Um, and I would, I would really recommend to people that if you haven't really sat down with your partner in a while, make sure you do that. Um, mm-hmm. And just get in good communication with them and just find out what's going on. Like, hey, what, what is the direction that you're going? What, why don't we just map something out? I mean, it doesn't take much to yeah. like imbue some life into a relationship. Yeah. Once you begin that communication cycle, you can start fixing a lot of things. Right. But it doesn't start until the communication begins. Yeah. And you got to be able to like um, take take responsibility, you know, and if there is some friction, if there is some upset, you know, don't just sit there and be right. Yeah. You know, you, you have to like take the other person's point of view. And that's the only way that any kind of conflict is going to get resolved. Mm-hmm. So Definitely. we're getting into conflict management right now, which is a totally different podcast. <laughs> we can do that as well. Yeah, exactly. But it is, it is, but you know, I think to your point on the alignment, it's, it, it really starts with common goals, common purposes, and, you know, you guys have some affinity for one another and, and you, and you share some, 
a, a, a genuine likingness. I think that's mm -hmm. important. So now what if it's like, hey, I'm an owner. Um, I'm not necessarily interested in giving up 49, 50% of the business, but I've got a clinic director that's been with me for five years. He or she is amazing. I yep. want to reward them. I want to incentivize them, or maybe I want to open up another clinic and they head it up and they have some form of partnership at that point. Uh, what are the things to consider at that point? Yeah. I mean, I think anytime that you have a, uh, you, you have to come up with some kind of a transition plan for yourself right. mm -hmm. and, and decide how am I going to transition out of this business? And there's different methods that you can do. Um, there's, you know, there's seven different ways you can exit out of a business. Uh, but I think the, you know, one of them is doing some kind of a, either what's called a buy-in or a buy-out. Mm -hmm. And I can go over, you know, the specifics of that. A buy-in yeah. would, would simply be where I have, I have one or two associates or clinical directors that would like to start buying into my practice. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they're going to buy in based upon the value of the business. And that is one method where I think a lot of people have been able to like take some risk out of the business for themselves mm -hmm. and, and also kind of liquidate a portion of their business and get some cash if right. they need that mm -hmm. uh, by allowing someone to buy in. Mm -hmm. So that, that is a, that is a method uh, to be able to, to bring on someone. So mm -hmm. let's say I have a practice that's worth $2 million and I want to, I want to have someone buy in like 25% of my business. Right. So they would have to come, they would have to come up with, you know, a half million dollars mm -hmm. to be able to, to do that. Now, right. most associates are not going to have $500,000 just sitting in their piggy bank, right? You know, to be able to do that. So you have to get a little, so you have to be willing at that point to seller finance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the benefit to you is that you're going to get the same amount of cash that you've been getting even before. Yeah. Cause you're, you're just, uh, the profits are just going to be paid back to you, except you're going to be getting it at capital gains tax rates. Cause it's going to be coming back to you at, at a lower tax rate nice. than what you're getting. So, you know, but that would be one method of bring of, of, of identifying someone and then saying, Hey, I'm going to let you buy into this business mm -hmm. for, you know, a, a value, a predetermined valuation. Gotcha. Now what, it, so that's, giving someone essentially some hard equity, right? You're talking yes. about hard equity options. What if, what if it's not a hard equity option and someone's just like, well, okay, maybe I don't want to go that far and actually give them a percentage of the company. Um, I, I hear many therapists uh, talk about how they're partners in their company. When I talk to them, I, I, essentially they're just getting profit sharing. Yeah. Right? So there yeah. is a way to get to be a quote unquote partner without necessarily giving up hard equity of the business, right? Well, sure. I mean, you can you can designate money like executive bonus plans or something like that, which is just, you know, the the owner saying, hey, look, you know, based upon our profit of the business, I'm going to share the profits with you, you know, with selected people in the organization. Right. Usually yeah. it's like a management team. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's like, hey, you know what, if we're profitable, I'm going to give you one percent or two percent of the profits. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, this is the arrangement that we would make. And that way, if you're an owner and you don't want to give up any of your equity, but you want to reward and kind of tie executives in so that they're mm -hmm. motivated based upon the profit of the organization, right. then you can just structure it, it, it that way. And there's a thousand different ways to do that. And, you know, but it's got to be on a percentage of, of the actual profit, not, right. not the revenue. Yeah. the actual profit of the organization, Big difference. you know, uh, and that, right. and that's, that's certainly a method you could do as well. Cause that's the, that's the thing that Will and I came up up against as we were uh, trying to figure out how we can incentivize and reward some of the clinic directors or management team members that we had. We went to a lawyer and the lawyer was like, and, and we said, Hey, we want to do some partnerships and maybe some profit sharing. And they're like, okay, how do you want to set it up? And we were like, well, we were hoping for some guidance. <laughs> <laughs> and so the lawyer just said, well, you could do it a thousand different ways. What do you guys want to do? And so I'm glad that we're talking a little bit about maybe considering the difference between hard, hard equity and yeah. just and some kind of profit sharing um, models, because 
there's, like you said, there's a thousand different ways to do it. But when it comes down to what you want to put in writing, the calculations got to be the same so everyone knows exactly how it's figured out. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I've seen some people do that with some some success as well. And, and again, I think anytime you, you know, you are trying to just reward people that are doing uh, that are producing for you, it's it's important that you incentivize them some way. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think trying to get people tied into the actual business, though, is uh, there's a risk to that. But I think at the yeah. end of the day, it's probably going to be a little bit more successful. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I gotcha. Definitely. And so, um, of course, I'm, I know you recommend getting a business attorney. So we just have to agree, hey, find a business attorney if you wanted to do this to write it up, spend the money that it takes to especially a business and acquisitions attorney that has specialized in this, right? You would 100% want to work with a company that specializes in, in how to bring on, um, uh, you know, in physical therapy, someone that's mm -hmm. done it that has that understands the agreements that are going to need to be in place because look you know when you have a when you bring on a partner you know you're now you're going to have you know a business entity that you guys are going to share uh and that there's there has to be like operating agreements and there has mm -hmm. to be management agreements and there have you know all these agreements that need to now be redone yeah. uh to include this new partner yeah, you need okay. to amend the LLC. You need to all amend all this stuff. So you really need to make sure that you have an attorney that uh, has specialized in mergers and acquisitions mm -hmm. in your industry. And there are definitely companies out there um, that uh, that that specialize in that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, they would perform the valuation most likely. They would perform to to determine what the value of the business would be. Right. They're going to create all the legal documents to be able to do that. They'll run the numbers you know, as far as, you know, this is what the profit would be entitled to for the new owner mm -hmm. and all of those, they'll, they'll help run all of those things. Mm -hmm. So I would, you know, it's going to cost you, you know, I don't know, five, 10,000 bucks to probably do something like that, right. but it's, you have to make sure that a handshake is no good, yeah. you know, Hey, I'll do this. You have to make <laughs> sure you keep the, the actual agreements in place. For yeah. Sure. And it, I think what a lawyer is also going to help you figure out is some kind of some kind of clauses so that, you know, the relationship between Will and myself when we finally got an attorney was such that we had an agreement as to how things would end, essentially, or uh -huh. when conflicts arose. This is how we would address conflicts. And there was the, I think it's called a shotgun clause, you know, if if you're going to try to buy me out at a smaller amount than it's valued, then I could, you know, I had the ability to turn around and buy you out yep. for that same amount. And then, but it also had conflict resolution uh, built into it Yes, because we were 50, 50 partners, which meant we had equal say we all, the, our lawyer broke it down. Like, okay. If you guys are really stuck on an important issue, who's going to be the tiebreaker. And we had to designate a certain person, uh, an agreed upon person that we both trusted to be the tiebreaker. And if we wanted to go to another level, we'd have, we'd have, we wrote out someone else as well. So yeah. it really helped us with breaking down. So we knew well ahead of time, if we ever had issues, this is how it was going to go down. Now, let me ask you this. How many times did you guys have to do that? Never, never, uh -huh. never. Right. But, but I know exactly. I remember exactly what would happen if we needed it. Yeah. But <laughs> But I think the, the thing is, is that when you when you kind of when you put something in place like that, it almost lessens the likelihood that that uncomfortable occurrence will ever happen. You know what I mean? I so it's like it's like when you when you take responsibility for doing something like that, you just lessen the likelihood that something bad's going to happen to you or, mm -hmm. or you're going to have an unfortunate situation occur. So right. um you know, look, if people don't take care of themselves, right? I mean, what's the likelihood that you're going to have health problems? Probably pretty high, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's it's not rocket science. It's just observable. Yeah. So, uh, but to your point, this is, it, you know, these these are what these agreements are there for. It, mm -hmm. You know, what happens if I die prematurely? Yeah. What happens if, uh, you know, somebody becomes disabled? What mm -hmm. happens if someone goes off the deep end, 
you know, right. and starts, right. you know, do, what, what are the, what is it, how is it written out? That's all written out in the members agreement, the operating mm -hmm. agreement, all those things are, it's all written out. So if you're bringing on a partner, you got to make sure that that gets amended, updated, and that it's reviewed, both people agree upon it, and it's executed. Yeah, so, because more often than not, a lot of the issues that I see arising, yeah, there could be a lacks of communication and one person not feeling like the other one's pulling their weight. But yeah. a, a lot of times it's simply one person who was in a happy marriage at the beginning of the partnership is no longer in that happy marriage. And nope. because of the the relationship to the partnership, there that totally causes things to get unraveled, things to get unraveled. And, and you know, whether it's marriage or drug abuse, alcohol abuse, yeah. all those things can have, can affect negatively on the business, of course, and addressing those um, with a legal document ahead of time, yep. makes it so much easier to just unwind when necessary. Yeah, there'll be personal uh, behavior uh, clauses in there as well. So if someone mm -hmm. is, you know, not working, doing drug, not fulfilling their end of the bargain, then the yeah. other person has the right to buy that other person out. Mm -hmm. you know so mm -hmm. it's you know all those things are part and parcel to, to that mm -hmm. and it's really key that you have those things but definitely make sure that you have an attorney don't just run just grab something off legalzoom.com oh. and do it to <laughs> make sure you have a mergers and acquisition attorney that that actually does that for you yeah exactly now you can have someone actually buy in um and we talked about partnerships to begin with if we have a yep. clinic director or someone who we uh, appreciate in the in the organization who we want to do some profit sharing with but talk to them to us a little bit of, then about buyout stuff that you brought up well I, I i think we'll talk about two things we'll talk about the buyout maybe the and then just granting people ownership yeah. that you feel like you know deserve that have sweat sweat equity so to speak yeah because uh, some people might not want to say hey i want you to buy out and you know there might they might have an umbrance and just say well i've been with you 15 years and and now you're asking me to buy into something that i've helped you build from the ground up right yeah in, in yeah. those situations you might want to just gift some kind of stock essentially yeah so let's just we'll, we'll talk about that one there yeah so there there may be instances where it's it's the value to you as the owner is that i don't I, number one, I have a person here that has been with me for 10 years, five years. They've helped me build this thing. Um, I really want to reward them. I want to give, uh, I, I want them to, you know, I want to be with them for the, the period of time that I own this business. Okay. I don't want to make them have to come up with the money because I feel like they've earned it already for right. the value of the business. Right. Okay. So what do you do there in those instances? Well, there's a couple of things you can do. Um, number one, you can gift them because everyone has a, uh, the ability to gift money or assets to somebody over their lifetime. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can gift them a, a percentage of the, of the, of the, of the, of the stock of, of the, the company. value of the company of the value of the company. Right. Oh, I, okay. I want to, I want to gift them 15% or 10% yeah. or whatever that would be. Okay. Yeah. And you, you'd need to get all the same agreements in place. You would need to make sure that there's, you know, member agreements and operating agreements, because now they're going to be a partner with you. Right. But as far as the action of actually gifting them the shares, you can do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that would, I mean, the negative thing is that it would take away from your lifetime gift exemption that you have, mm -hmm. whatever that, whatever that amount would be. Um, but it would be no negative tax consequence to them. Nice. And that would be, I mean, that would be a hell of a thing to do. So yeah. I've seen some owners do that. Yeah. And the same thing, the merger and acquisition lawyer would help you with something like this. Absolutely. Or is this a CPA yeah. type thing? It's, a, you know, it's going to be both. You're going to bring okay. a, a CPA is going to be needed for both. Mm -hmm. um, but, but honestly, it's, uh, it's not a, you know, the, there just need to be agreements that are that are um, created and you know okay. legal document that says I'm gifting this percentage of the business, which is valued at this to this mm -hmm. person and and you know that's uh, I mean I'm sure there's a lot more to it but that's essentially what you would do. Yeah, and it's important to figure out how that's going to affect you and them because it's a very nice thing to do that they're not going to get taxed on this gift that you're providing them. Yeah, um, but it also. Uh, lim decreases the amount of gifting that you can do to other employees or even your children, grandchildren in the future or wife that, in the future, right? That's the downside to it. So if you don't want to do that and you still want to be able to, to, to give them percentage of the, of the company, then you would do what's called a grant. 
So it's a little different. It's a little nuanced, but essentially you could, and this is how I actually got uh, part ownership of uh, our company in the beginning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I got a grant of stock. Okay. Mm-hmm. So what that means is that I got, uh, you know, let's say 25% of the company granted to me. Yeah. Right. So a, a grant, I was, you know, it was granted to me. Um, now I did have to pay tax on the, the value of whatever that, that grant percentage. was. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, that's, that's fine because I got the value of it. I just have to pay the tax on it. You know, right. it was a big, it was right. a big tax bill, right. but uh, essentially that's, um, that's what the person would be on the hook for. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, maybe the, but they would be entitled to that percentage of the profits. So, you know, maybe the first year, the, the profits that you get, you know, you're going to go to <laughs> uncle Sam, right. But you know, after that, uh, you're, you're getting a percentage of the profits and you don't have to pay for the value of the business. Okay. So mm-hmm. it's that, that is, I've seen that done. Um, it probably at least a dozen times mm-hmm. for people that, that want to, that want to reward someone that's been with them a long time yeah. and, uh, and, or just want to keep someone really tied into them and give them the sweat equity. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. I think so- it's a really, I think it's a really fabulous tool. Yeah, and the, the, and the hopefully the the pe- person who is getting granted that stock recognizes that number one that they are going to have to pay taxes on it, and you want to be upfront about that. Of and course, two, that they recognize that it's still a gift, and and it, it shouldn't be a, a, an upset for them to consider that they have to pay taxes on something that came to them for free, right? Yeah. 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 If someone has a bad reaction to that, that's a bad indicator right there. That yeah, you might not want to do <laughs> you that. Wanna, you may want to rethink that. that you might want to rethink this you know, partnership to begin exactly. with. Exactly. Right? You know, if you get that kind of a bad indicator. Yeah. But that, but that would be, uh, I think, a very um, simple way to give someone that sweat equity that's been with you a long time and really mm-hmm. tie in a, a, a top performer uh, that you think can maybe take over ownership or help the practice grow even more. Right. You know, so yeah. granting of stock is, is a, is a really cool tool. Have you seen a granting of stock as well? I guess that's not a way to buy out because then the owner doesn't walk away with anything. It'd be more of the buy-in. And uh, have you ever seen a situation where the employees buy out the owner and then take ownership of the company? Have you worked in that scenario? Well, there's something called like an employee stock ownership plan. It's called an ESOP which is mm-hmm. actually a, a method of um, where an owner can, you know, get, take his shares and have the actual employees buy into like a, an actual, almost like a profit sharing plan yeah. and, um, and buy out the owner that way. Mm-hmm. It, it's super expensive to set something like that, but you really need to have at least like a million dollar EBITDA to be oh, able wow. to do something like that. So okay. not a lot of practice owners have that kind of, that EBITDA. Mm -hmm. But, um, I would say that, uh, you know, it would just be as easy to, uh, have an associate, uh, or two maybe buy you out. Yeah. I got you. And that, and that would be an easier method. Now you still may have to carry a note in that, in that uh, scenario where you do Mm -hmm. a buyout, you know, so let's say you have one or two, one or two associates that want to buy you out completely. They just say that we're going to buy you hundred percent out. Right. right? So we, the agree, the value is $3 million and then we're going to pay you, you know, $300,000 $300,000 a year for the next 10 years at a 6% uh-huh. interest rate. Right. Okay. Right, right, right. And you can do that. I mean, mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's, a, that's a buyout method. You just okay. got to make sure that they're, they know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, they stay solvent. Doing that exactly. <laughs> exactly. A hundred percent. Gotcha. So if you're looking at maybe granting some kind of hard equity, then you're looking at a, a buy-in option, granting or gifting right? Mm -hmm. And if you're not looking at granting this person actual stock in the company, then you're talking about profit sharing models that could be rather diverse, um, essentially. And there's many ways to cut that pie. All in all, we're all, we're also saying, you know, start with the basics. Let's go back to starting building the foundation, make sure the values and alignment are there. The goals are uh, agreed upon and that everyone's in good communication right? And then start with a mergers and acquisitions attorney and go from there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it seems like a lot and it it really is. But I think if you just, if you, if you start there, uh, it's all the methods, all the techniques, all the technical stuff that can be figured out. 
right. you know, but really coming up with, well, I think the methods are, are really kind of an important thing and, and having someone that has done it before or has some experience with it can give you the pros and cons to each of mm-hmm. these different methods. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, spend some time on it. Don't make a rash decision, really think about it and look at yeah. it and make sure that it's beneficial for you. Cause mm-hmm. when you know, when you do sell a portion of your business, you are giving up that percentage of profits to your household. Right. So make sure that you understand, you know, are, are, are you financially ready to be able to do that? And mm-hmm. are you doing, are you doing this to expand uh, or buy you, buy you more time for yourself? Like what's the reason, like really mm-hmm. think about the reason that you want to bring out a partner right. uh, from that respect. You know, I, I would say that the the clinic owners that have done the best from my personal experience are those that have successfully navigated this. They have somehow been able to either with profit sharing or uh, getting some kind of hard equity buy in have been able to bring on partners and expand their practices um, without them having to do it all right. There, yeah. there's, some, there's something to having partners in each of those locations that incentivizes that person that's on site to really build it and make it successful. Uh, those are the people that have been the most successful in, in the physical therapy owner space that I've seen. Yeah, I think you're right, which is another model too. You you could just, um, you know, if you want to expand, maybe, you know, if you're looking at different locations, just partner with someone at that location. And, mm-hmm. you know, maybe you own 51%, they own 49% in some mm-hmm. model. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe that's, you know, another way that you can expand as Mm -hmm. well. Just give, you know, ownership of that particular practice. Right. Um, Yeah. And some of the, some of the larger privately owned clinics that I know they do exactly that, you know, though that person on site might have 49% or less of the business. Right. But they get a a relatively average salary mm -hmm. uh, on top of maybe monthly or quarterly distributions, but their job is to, you run that clinic. There you go. Yeah, you you, you run the practice, and then the the I guess the parent company is going to do a lot of the marketing. They're going to do a lot of the collections, the billing, the billing and, mm-hmm. you know, HR. Um, HR, all of that. So it really allows you know it's a good model. You know, if you yeah. if you just want that owner, just to, I want you to focus on management of the business and the production and right. patients right. and those kinds of things. So it yeah. definitely can work. Yeah, definitely. Well, if people have more questions for you about partnerships. Um, how would they get in touch with you, man? It's just go to econologics.com and uh, we can, you can download uh, a ton of uh, information that we have. And, you know, we're actually going to be creating a checklist of yeah. uh, as because uh, transitioning is something you have to think about all the yeah, time, for sure, right? Like mm-hmm. you're the, the transition of your business, like the moment that you start your business, you should be thinking about your transition. So, but there, you know, obviously there's different time frames. So we're going to create like a checklist as like a, you know, if you're going to exit out in one year, these are things that you should be looking at three years. This is what you should be looking at five years. These are all the things that you should be looking mm. at. And, and then that way, you know, you're, uh, you're on, you're on the right track to get a, a an exit that is going to create maximum value for mm-hmm. you and your household, gotcha. you know, which I think is what everyone's really shooting for. Yeah. That's cool. And hopefully t- people take advantage of that because I, I'm pretty certain that most owners listening, if they're thinking, Hey, yeah, I want to act exit out and say three to five years, they just assume it's going to happen and don't need know that they need to prepare for it. Yes. <laughs> right. So yeah, that's why you're making a checklist. <laughs> I, would, I would say this. Yes. From experience, you know, it's, it's not good to, to try to, to have no plan and you want to transition out in 90 days. Yeah, that's, that's bad. Okay. It's, It's you're not not likely to, you're not likely to get the value that you want for the business. That's That's what happens to a lot of people though. They end up like saying, you know, I'm done with it. I'm just, I want to get out and they end up selling for, you know, some discount of, of what they possibly could make. And, you know, it's not anywhere near what the practice could be worth. And that's, that's sad. Mm -hmm. I hate to see that it happens more often than not. Whereas Whereas if they spend a little bit time simply, most of the time, it's just some organization. That's it. Put some organization together. Put some. Put your policy and procedures together, and that can dramatically increase the value. I don't think people realize how much that can increase the value of your business yeah. because yeah. it just is the point of expansion right there. Mm-hmm. And you know, you can't build a business on chaos, so you have right. to have something in in order. But yeah, it doesn't take much time, mm-hmm. and you know, there's thousands of 
resources and materials out there. Um, hiring consultants, I think, is I, I can't I can't express the return on investment with a good consultant. I just can't because yeah. I've seen it. I've seen people that have hired consultants, and you know your profit margins increase by just two, three, four, five percent, mm -hmm. and it's like the value of your business because it's based upon a multiple, right? Of that profit. Is, of the profit that it you know increases it by hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars right good plug for me i appreciate that eric i did that on purpose thanks man <laughs> <laughs> cool all right well hey thanks for your time today i appreciate it yeah brother good to see you all right see you